Hey class, welcome back to Introduction to Ethics. I hope you're all doing well today. Last time we finished up our look at Ethics at the Beginning of Life Part 1, and today we'll be looking at Ethics at the Beginning of Life Part 2. And in this lecture coming up, we'll be looking at reproductive technology and the ethical issues that come up with that. Stay tuned for the PowerPoint. Okay class, we're going to now move into the PowerPoint portion of this lecture, Ethics at the Beginning of Life Part 2. And just some introductory materials um, we'll talk about here uh, today. Uh, since the 1970s, there have been remarkable advances in reproductive technology. However, many of these technologies raise ethical questions. So just because we have the technology doesn't mean it's okay to do some of these things. The primary options offered by fertility clinics in regards to these technological advances are uh, intrauterine insemination, which is called IUI, uh, donor insemination, uh, egg donation, in vitro fertilization and surrogate motherhood. And we'll be talking about uh, some of these things in this PowerPoint and the next one coming up. Okay, so the morality of reproductive technologies. There are a wide variety of views regarding the morality of reproductive technologies. Uh, some, some people might hold uh, that all of them are immoral uh, and you shouldn't in interfere at all with any kind of reproduction and that would uh, definitely be a view of the, of the Catholic Church actually holds to that view that uh, natural law should take place and man should not interfere with it w in any way. But there are two fundamental questions raised by reproductive technology. And these are the two questions. Should any artificial means of conceiving a child be used? And if so, is it acceptable to use third-party genetic donors? And so those are the two uh, areas that we're going to be basically investigating in the, these uh, two PowerPoints. But of course, because uh, we're a Christian school and we come from a biblical worldview, we are going to talk about, uh, about the biblical worldview of this. And of course, the Bible does not address the issue of reproductive technology. Um, obviously, it wasn't it wasn't around then. So, as science improves in the modern time, it, it just continues to push the technological boundaries. And so, uh, we we need to look at the Bible. So, what do we look at? We look at the biblical principles in the Bible, and in our approach, we're going to be looking at what we call fence posts, and that, that's from the book. He calls them fence posts, and these are boundaries the Christian should contemplate prior to making a decision. And so we have the four fence posts here listed on the screen and a little graphic uh, will be coming up in the next slide to kind of show us visually kind of like what it looked like and where we stand in regards to these fence posts. So fence post number one, the place for medical technology and reproduction. Okay, God has given common grace to combat the effect of sin and in this case infertility. Now, infertility does not necessarily, necessarily come from the, the husband and wife committing a sin, and that's so they're infertile, but just in regards to um, the fall of man with Adam and Eve and when they sinned, uh, infertility uh, is a result of the fall. And so um, God has given us medical technology and, and the science to be able to uh, do different things in regards to um, medical technology. As, as common grace. It's just something that we can do that God has uh, allowed us to do to be able to um, scientifically uh, approach different uh, difficulties in life. Fence post number two is sanctity of life from conception. Okay, so as we looked at in the uh, part one of ethics at the beginning of life, uh, the biblical worldview would be that life begins at conception. And so that is a person. And so um, we need to uh, ensure that that's protected. There's sanctity of life from conception. The fetus is a person, therefore any embryos created must never be destroyed. Because if you destroy an embryo, you're destroying a person. Fence post number three, adoption. Okay, when we look at infertility and the technologies that are available for infertility, well, if, if uh, it's going to be pushing the boundaries and stepping outside of the moral fence posts or, that we're looking at here, we can always look at adoption because adoption is always a viable um, way to bring a, a child into the home, whether that be a child that is um, an, an infant and brought into the home, or even an older child. It's just adoption. And what it is, this is modeled. Um, you know, we see this in the Bible through our own salvation and deliverance from sin, where Christians are adopted by God. And, um, and we become part of the family of God through adoption when we are saved and, and redeemed from our sin. Well, you, know, you kind of look at that with, uh, with adoption of a child that needs, uh, that needs a home. 
And then also fence post number four, uh, sanctity of marriage. And this is kind of a, an important one, especially when we start looking at uh, surrogacy. Uh, the sanctity of marriage. I mean, this is the biblical mandate, and we will look at some verses here coming up. But it's the biblical mandate uh, for uh, for marriage, and that it's it's a man and a woman. So uh, if we start bringing in other other people into that, there can be uh, definitely issues and moral issues involved. There. So here's a couple other points just to kind of help Christians stay within the boundaries regarding reproductive technology. As I said, number one, medical technology is part of God's good gift to humans, just like other technologies are. Man has the, um, God has given man the knowledge and, and the skills to be able to uh, invent things and do different things. Well, medical technology is no exception, and we, we've done uh, great things in regards to medical technology, but this is all coming from God. God has gifted humans with this ability uh, to, um, to have these medical breakthroughs. But we, again, we got to be careful not to uh, to violate biblical standards and and moral standards. Number two, procreation is to be taking uh, take place within a stable heterosexual monogamous marriage. Okay, and we're going to be looking at that um, here coming up uh, with uh, with surrogacy. That um, this is God's plan for the family. That there's a uh, mother and a father who come together. They're heterosexual and they uh, belong to one another. As the Bible says, it's monogamous. So they they've um, you know, vowed to be with each other only, and they're married. There's marriage, and so that is where procreation is to be taking place. Anything else out of that is going to be outside of uh, of God's plan. Whatever, number three, whatever reproductive technology is used in order to become pregnant must not destroy embryos created in the process. And we're going to be looking at that coming up, that there's embryos that are created and that they're either not implanted or uh, there's numerous ones implanted and there's selective uh, abortion that takes place to get rid of unwanted embryos if there's multiple um, implanted embryos where the mother would, would have um, you know, a large number of children uh, in that one pregnancy. Number four, any view of procreation that rules out adoption as a possibility may fall outside the biblical parameters. Okay, so again, it's it's if it rules out adoption, like there's no no way to do this, uh, you know, and where we can have the embryos adopted out, like so, such as like a snowflake or uh, they call it like a snowflake uh, baby or anything like that, where it's just like this this act results in one implanted embryo and the rest are just destroyed. There's no way for adoption or anything like that. That's going to fall outside of biblical parameters. Number five, it is important to recognize God's sovereignty in all of this. And again, it's very painful for an infertile couple to um, to go through that, not being able to uh, get pregnant or have a baby. Uh, and and you know, there's these are very expensive procedures, and they might not be able to afford it, and all of these things. Well, uh, the Christian couple they need to step back and also recognize that God is sovereign. God is on His throne, and God will take care of them. And if um, and if available, they, they always have that, uh, that option uh, for, for adoption and adopting a child. Uh, number six, all children are a gift from the Lord. That's a biblical principle. And if all children are a gift from the Lord, then that means any uh, um, fertilized egg, any embryo, which is a person, that is a gift from the Lord. So there's sanctity uh, with that life. Okay, so we see uh, six uh, points uh, just to help Christians stay within the boundaries. And so this is just, a, like I said, a graphic to visualize it. Uh, we have the fence posts on the corners. Uh, number one, place for medical technology. Number two, sanctity of life. Number three, adoption. Number four, sanctity of marriage. And so if we stay within these boundaries, uh, then the medical technology that is able to be used w w should you know should not have an issue morally uh, or ethically and definitely biblically. Uh, but it's when we start going outside of these boundaries. And so inside this box are, are the points that I just read there from the previous slide. Medical technology is a gift, must not destroy embryos. Um, you, you know, any view to procreate, of procreation that rules out adoption as a possible ability may fall outside biblical parameters. Procreation is to take place within a stable heterosexual monogamous marriage. God is sovereign. If a, the, the Christian couple sticks to these uh, points and inside these fence posts, then they should be able to make a good biblical ethical decision. Okay, we're going to look at two uh, reproductive technologies here in this PowerPoint. The first one is intrauterine insemination, IUI, and the second one is in vitro fertilization. 
Okay, so the first one, intrauterine insemination, IUI. In the case of IUI, the husband's genetic material, meaning coming from the sperm, is inseminated into the wife's uterus. And so because it's husband and wife, it's just basically the, the wife's egg is able to be inseminated by the husband's sperm through medical technology uh, to where they would have a successful um, fertilization of the egg and then it could be then go through uh, to where it can be implanted. So really this does not seem to be any issue at all because it's the husband and wife. It's just medical technology helps them out a little bit. However, this is where it becomes morally questionable. See, it says there, IUI becomes morally questionable when the woman is given ovulation drugs to facilitate the release of 8 to 10 eggs, which pose the possibility of multiple conceptions. So she takes uh, fertility drugs or ovulation drugs. It causes her to release uh, more than the, the normal number of eggs, and then... Uh, if these eggs are, if numerous eggs are inseminated, then multiple eggs can implant and you have multiple conception. That's where you have um, women that uh, through uh, fertility drugs, uh, they get pregnant with, with uh, multiple, multiple babies, uh, not just twins, but it could be, you know, four or five children. Even the, the very famous news story uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Octomom, where she had eight, eight children. So, um, you, you see that there's this can be morally questionable when there's multiple conceptions because especially when the doctor is saying it's for the health of the mother, the couple will be forced to choose which uh, ones to terminate, which ones to abort. So it can lead uh, to that uh, that ethical dilemma. Uh, but right off, right at the start, it doesn't seem like it would be an ethical issue, uh, but it can lead to an ethical issue. And now we're going to talk about in vitro fertilization IVF. The term in vitro literally means in glass which indicates where fertilization takes place and it's in a lab and it's usually in a petri dish where the eggs are in the petri dish and they, the sperm is put in and it fertilizes the egg. And this is what it what, you know, used to be called uh, test tube babies. With the help of ovulation drugs, a woman, uh, she again can produce between 8 to 10 eggs in the lab, there can be up to 10 eggs fertilized, so now you have 10 embryos. And again, in biblical uh, viewpoint, those each embryo is a person because that they become a person at conception. And so then there needs to be a selection for which eggs that are fertilized, which ones will be placed in the womb. And this sets up for the dilemmas with IVF. So we're going to continue here now looking at these dilemmas. Dilemma number one, the couple will be forced to choose which ones to terminate if, if that's the option that they can terminate the ones they don't want. Um, and that may be because of, of different um, grades of embryos, which we're going to talk about here in a second, number two. But it's kind of like the same case as the IUI, force the couple to choose which ones to terminate um, either at, from the implantation and then they're going to abort uh, certain uh, implanted embryos or uh, just the ones that weren't selected for uh, the IVF from the Petri dish, they, they are discarded so then um, they're terminated. Number two, the lab grades the embryos and it's a high, medium, or low. And so the, the condition of the fertilized egg when it's an embryo in the Petri dish there's going to be a grading system. So it's high, medium, low, and obviously the low is like lower survival. High is like the one that you would want. And so it allows for the low and even the medium embryos uh, to be discarded and, and only the high embryos used. Well, if those uh, embryos are persons, which we believe they are at conception, then the, you're basically just discarding people. Number three, uh, thawing of the frozen embryo can result in its death. What can be looked at is that this is compared to a natural miscarriage. So what's the difference if uh, thawing the frozen embryo, it, it dies, so basically it's, it, it was like a miscarriage. Well, a miscarriage is uh, you know, unfortunately a natural occurrence. Uh, a natural miscarriage is a natural occurrence uh, in, the, in the process of, of pregnancy, and it can happen. However, if death occurs from the thawing procedure, that is not a natural uh, event that takes place. That is part of this IVF process, the thawing, so that um, the frozen embryo that's now thawed can be implanted. Um, 
well, that's not a natural event. That was that event was initiated by man to thaw the embryo that was frozen, and if it results in its death, that means man's actions caused the death of that embryo. So it's not a natural event. So that's an, that's a dilemma there. Number four, if an embryo is a person, which we believe biblically uh, conception, the embryo is a person. Freezing the embryo is the same as freezing a person, and. Uh, the, in the book, it definitely compares, you know, a, a, a mother and father would never consider freezing their five-year-old, even if that was possible, to where that they can be thawed later or something. Uh, you know, and there's some science fiction things that you freeze, uh, freeze people with like uh, cryogenics. And then 50 years from now, when they have the cure to a disease, they're thawed and then, then given the cure to a disease, uh, something like that. Uh, you know, we, we would never even think of that, freezing a person. But that's exactly what's taking place when an embryo uh, is frozen. Now, and, and there are Christians that you know, follow this, and, and they don't see any kind of ethical dilemma with this. Um, but th that's really what is taking place. Uh, number five, purposeful multiple implantations can lead to selected termination. So again, if you have multiple uh, embryos and you want the best chance to have a pregnancy, then multiple embryos are implanted, and then later they'll there's selective termination. They're 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 aborted. Some of them are aborted for that uh, that one uh, embryo uh, to be able to thrive in the womb. So. People, people land on different areas uh, with this. With this, so there, there can be Christians that that you know might not have a moral issue with embryos being frozen and then used later on. Uh, so they might not have a problem with number four. Uh, but there are always going to be consequences with things. So, for example, so if a couple decides to freeze eight of their embryos and later on they begin to thaw some of them for uh, IVF, uh, some of those embryos might die. Well, again, that's going to be now looking like a violation there in regards to number three. So it, it just depends on where people land on this, uh, but these are the dilemmas uh, that, that people face. If per personhood begins at conception, then destroying embryos is tantamount to abortion. Okay, that, and So that's one of the principles uh, that we've been looking at now for a, a while, that at conception it's a person, so if the embryo is destroyed, then basically an abortion has taken place. The general principles that should guide a couple's use of IVF are that all embryos created in the lab should have a reasonable chance at maturing. Okay, so if a couple decides to have uh, six embryos uh, created in a lab, all six of those uh, in some way should have a reasonable chance of maturing. So, number one, all embryos should be implanted in the mother utilizing the treatment or an adoptive mother. So the reason that there are so many eggs inseminated is it's be a better chance for the embryo to implant when it is placed into the mother. Well, uh, if the couple decides we're going to just do two, and they put both of those uh, embryos into the mother, and both of them implant, well, then she'll carry twins, and that's, that's not uncommon. If you go in and implant six, well, then you might actually have six implanted embryos in that mother. And that, that's going to cause issues later on with the, the large number of babies within her. Um, so if it's a numerous amount, well, then the fertilized embryos could actually be given to, like, an, an adoptive mother. And that's where we think of, like, uh, snowflake babies uh, where – and but snowflake babies, are the embryos are frozen – and adopted as a frozen embryo and then placed into the adoptive mother. But it's the same kind of an idea that um, an adoptive mother could actually have an implanted embryo uh, placed inside of her. And then, and then that adoptive mother would become the mother of that, that other baby. So it's just, it would be just like a, an adoption. Number two, no embryos should be discarded or subject to experimentation. So if it's a Christian couple that is you know, pondering IVF, Number two is a big one. There should be no embryos that are discarded or subject to experimentation or destroyed or something like that. That should never happen. And then number three, no embryos should be left in a frozen storage in perpetuity, which means like um, never ending. 
frozen storage. Because again, if, if the embryo is a person from uh, conception, well, then that, that's a frozen person. You can't just leave them frozen forever. And so usually um, the, the labs, they have like a time limit for when they would view that the embryo is even viable anymore. And it's, it's well over a decade, uh, maybe even like 14, 15 years that an embryo can be frozen, thawed, and then successfully implanted. Uh, but if, you know, if it, if it's frozen for you know thirty years, you know that's a person that's frozen. You, you just can't leave that embryo in in permanent storage. Number four, couples should only fertilize the eggs they are planning on implanting and no more. So if uh, they fertilize two eggs and they go and place two eggs in the mother and they both uh, fertilized eggs in the mother and they both implant, then she has twins. But if she goes and uh, for the uh, fertilized egg, let's say one implants and the other one doesn't implant, well then that's like a miscarriage. They should only fertilize the eggs that they're going to uh, be using. Number five, the number of embryos implanted should not exceed the number of children a couple wants. Okay, so example, they, they, if they say we, we want um, you know just one child and that's all they want, well then they should only implant one embryo um, in, into the mother. Number six, under no circumstances should a couple authorize implantation that might make selective termination an option. So the Christian couple should never say, well, just put them all in, and then later on we'll, we'll choose which ones to get rid of, and then we'll continue on with the pregnancy of the one. Uh, that should, under no circumstance should a Christian couple, because what that is, that's, just, that's basically just selective abortion. Okay, so that's it for Chapter 6, Ethics at the Beginning of Life, Part 2, and then we're going to have our second video lecture uh, coming up uh, next time. All right, class, that's it for today. Next time, we'll be looking at Ethics at the Beginning of Life, Part 2, where we'll be looking at surrogacy. I'll see you then.